No place on earth really carries the same level of mystery, sense of discovery or adventure than that of the frozen continent of Antarctica. Since its tentative discovery by Captain Cook in the 1770s and its eventual sighting by Von Bella Houston in the 1820s, people have been desperate to understand, explore and of course lay claim to this harsh, bleak wasteland. To do this, however, innovation was required. Each expedition to the Antarctic from the very start until today has brought new and experimental equipment and techniques to better explore and conquer Antarctica's unforgiving, almost otherworldly environment. Innovation would not prove easy, however. Specifically, early vehicles and motorised equipment were still very much in their infancy during the very early Antarctic explorations. And each early attempt to introduce them to the difficult landscape and conditions suffered faults and failures and numerous setbacks. Ernest Shackleton in the Nimrod expedition that achieved the furthest south in 1909 managed to bring the first motor car to the continent, a specially designed vehicle for pulling sledges donated by the Scottish William Beardmore and company. However, it was ultimately unsuccessful in navigating the ice and the deep snow and running in sub-zero temperatures. Robert Falcon Scott, seeing potential in Shackleton's idea though, pioneered experimental though ultimately unsuccessful motor-driven sledges in his ill-fated race to the pole two years later. Finally, Mawson, the famed Australian explorer, attempted to bring the first aeroplane to the continent in 1911. The plane, however, crashed during an air show demonstration before they even left for the expedition. Mawson was forced to make the best out of a bad situation and had it hastily converted into an experimental air tractor for pulling sledges. This, too, was unsuccessful and it was eventually abandoned and claimed by the Antarctic snowdrifts, much like the motor car and the motor sledges before it. The road to success, they say, is paved with failure. But worst was yet to come, for in the 1930s the Antarctic was home to one of the most incredible vehicles ever made. Impressive not just in its gigantic size and innovative features for the time, but remarkable in its almost instantaneous and complete failure. I'm referring to the relatively unknown, but nonetheless incredible, Antarctic Snow Cruiser. Camden, New Jersey. Accepting an auto gyro for his South Pole expedition, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd says farewell to the USA. Now I wish you all good luck and bid you goodbye. Richard E. Byrd was an American naval officer and polar explorer. Byrd had become known for his disputed flight over the North Pole, as well as a transatlantic flight in 1927. From the late 1920s, he had been organising expeditions into Antarctica, taking the place of what had predominantly been a British and Norwegian effort during the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. He had established two bases on the continent, Little America in 1929 and Little America II in 1934. By the end of the 1930s, war was threatening to engulf the globe for a second time and both Nazi Germany and the Empire of Japan were increasing activities and territorial ambitions around Antarctica. President Roosevelt wanted to make US presence in the Antarctic firmly established and thus Byrd's newly planned third expedition grew from the smaller privately funded enterprises of the past two trips and into a far reaching US scheme to establish bases on both sides of Antarctica, one which was to be the third Little America base. It was to be organised jointly with the US Departments of State, War, the Navy and the Interior and it was one of the major turning points in America's interest and dedication to the Antarctic on a governmental level. The world, especially the nations very much interested in laying claim to parts of Antarctica, were on tenterhooks to find out the final scale and aims of this grand American Antarctic expedition, the largest one seen so far. None, however, could probably guess just what was about to roll onto the stage. You see, Byrd had been inspired by the partial success of Robert Falcon Scott's motor sledges from 1910, and Byrd had had considerable success with tracked vehicles in his second expedition. In fact, their use had directly saved his life when he had been stranded alone in a remote outpost during the second expedition. His deputy, Dr Thomas Poulter, had spent the years since trying to replace the motorised adapted tractors they had used with a more reliable form of transport that could be better suited to the difficult Antarctic conditions. Working with the Armour Institute of Technology in Chicago, now the Illinois Institute of Technology, Poulter designed what he called the Snow Cruiser. 
55 feet long, 25 feet wide and weighing 37 tons fully loaded. This gigantic vehicle was designed to have the range of over 8,000 miles and sustain a crew for up to a year on the ice without resupply. The giant machine was powered by two huge diesel engines giving it a proposed speed of up to 55 miles per hour. She was also crammed with a lot of clever innovations. Her four 10 foot tall balloon wheels could be moved individually and lifted clear of crevices and other obstructions. They could also retract into the chassis of the cruiser itself where an innovative central heating system could keep the rubberized tires warm via the heat directed from the engine bay. Inside featured all the facilities a crew of four could need for exploring and living in the Antarctic wastes while they racked up the miles. It included a control cabin, a machine shop, a combination galley and darkroom, extra tanks for fuel, food stores, a crew quarters and even space aft for two gigantic spare tyres. And the range of gadgets and proposed capabilities didn't end there. On the top of the snow cruiser was even a cradle for an aircraft that could be used for finding routes through the snow and ice. With a range of around 300 miles miles this plane could be loaded via the sloped back of the cruiser acting as a scout to the gigantic wheeled mothership. The snow cruiser would be one of the most ambitious vehicles ever designed and to justify this monster Poulter had big plans for how this one-of-a-kind vehicle would revolutionize the Antarctic exploration. US government officials gave the go-ahead on the project handing over $150,000 almost three million dollars in today's money to construct just the cruiser for the forthcoming expedition. The Antarctic cruiser was seen as a clear advantage to the US expedition, especially when recent competition from other countries was starting to pick up. While the US was preparing for more expeditions, a German catapult ship Schwabenland had been operating survey planes around the Antarctic and claiming large tracts of land in the name of Nazi Germany. In an effort to further impress and justify the huge budget for this project, Poulter made extraordinary claims about the cruiser's capabilities, telling one congressional committee it could explore over 500,000 square miles of unknown territory during a single Antarctic summer. With international competition worrying the government and the deadline for the expedition now looming, the Antarctic cruiser was hurriedly constructed in the Pullman coach works in Chicago just in time for the expedition's departure. It created a national stir as it raced off the production line and across over a thousand miles of American roads to reach the Boston dockyard where the expedition would depart. Wider than most roads, the cruiser closed highways and forced cars off the road as it trundled through the states followed by a convoy of police cars. The cruiser at one point actually ran off the road and became stranded in a creek which was hardly the most encouraging show of strength for a vehicle that was supposed to soon traverse some of the most difficult and unknown landscapes on earth. Nonetheless, it reached the expedition docks in time and was loaded onto the deck of the supply ship North Star, along with expedition supplies, stores, prefabricated huts and several tanks that had been loaned by the Department of War for testing on the Antarctic ice. The entire aft wheel section of the vehicle had to be removed moved just to fit her on board and it was only with Bird's absolute insistence that she was even allowed on at all due to worries about her huge bulk destabilizing the ship. Finally, with much fanfare, the North Star with the cruiser strapped precariously to her deck nervously edged out of the Boston docks and left for Antarctica on the 15th of November 1939. The New York Times reported, perhaps somewhat presumptuously, that the snow cruiser has connected West Base with East Base or has rolled along the coast which no man has surely seen or perhaps made itself a laboratory base for periods of months at the pole itself. None of these hopeful claims, it turned out, were to come true. The expedition arrived at the site of Little America 3 in January 1940. As you can see from some of the only pieces of colour film footage of the snow cruiser, the unloading itself almost ended in disaster when it broke through the wooden ramps leading from the North Star and onto the ice itself. You can see Bird here riding on the roof and being nearly thrown off when the giant cruiser suddenly shifts. The situation is only saved when Poulter, who's at the controls of this huge machine, hits the accelerator, lurching the cruiser forward and on to the relative safety of the ice. Unfortunately, worst was to come for the cruiser. The vehicle that was meant to be able to climb slopes of up to 37 degrees was practically immovable on the snow and ice, even after the two huge spare tyres were fitted for extra traction. Nicknamed the Bouncing Betty, it was simply too heavy and its innovative diesel-electric drivetrain was too underpowered. The cruiser's only limited success was found in driving it in reverse, and even then, at such slow speed, that it essentially proved useless. After some fruitless attempts at 
that longer range exploration, the expedition was forced to admit the cruiser was useless as anything other than a cramped stationary laboratory and crew quarters. Its innovative heating system and insulation actually proved quite effective, but the great beast was consigned to forever remain at the western base of the Antarctic continent. Eventually buried in snow, it was abandoned when the Little America 3 base was defunded and eventually evacuated in 1941 as concentration moved towards the war effort. So what happened to the snow cruiser? Well, in 1946, five years later, just after World War II and part of Operation High Jump, another American Antarctic expedition, teams located the abandoned base and the gigantic snow cruiser, still sitting where it had been left. The team found the vehicle to be in remarkably good condition, reporting that only air in the tyres and a basic servicing would have had it up and running again. However, nothing further was done and the beast was once again left to the elements. Finally, in 1958, the cruiser made her final appearance, this time to an international expedition who uncovered the snow cruiser from its tomb of snow and ice with a bulldozer. She was hidden underneath several feet of snow, but a long bamboo pole still marked her position. The team were able to dig down to the bottom of the wheels and measure the amount of snowfall that it had seen since the cruiser was abandoned. Inside, the vehicle was exactly as the crew had left it almost two decades ago, with papers, magazines and cigarettes still scattered around. They then left for the final time, probably unaware that they were to be the last people to ever see this incredible and unique snow cruiser ever again. Or were they? Could it be that the snow cruiser still sits under the snow and ice of the Bay of Wales? Only recently a team located the remains of Mawson's air tractor from the 1911 Australasian Antarctic expedition, buried under three metres of ice where she too had been abandoned. Relics of the various expeditions in the south are still discovered on a semi-regular basis, preserved in the sub-zero temperatures. Some conspiracy theories even maintain that the Soviets recovered the cruiser for themselves after its last discovery. So, is there still hope for the snow cruiser? The reality, sadly, is probably not. You see, in February 1963, the US Navy icebreaker Adisto sighted an unusual streak of black amongst the whites and blues of passing icebergs in the Ross Sea. As they edged closer, they were amazed to find what appeared to be the remains of one of Little America's stations buried in the ice. The Adisto's helicopter landed on the iceberg and attempted to gain entry to the station, but they were ultimately unable to find a way in. However, what could be clearly made out were the remains of tents, fabric and even prefabricated huts bisected as the iceberg had broken away from the Ross ice shelf. Much like the team who had discovered the base and the cruiser in the 1950s, cans and equipment placed neatly and left on shelves were still clearly visible, still preserved in time from the moment the site had been abandoned all those years ago. Five telephone poles and antenna fittings stood there above the snow, and what's more, two bamboo marker poles were still in place. If we are to presume that this was likely the remains of Little America 3, it means the majority, if not all, of the site has now washed out to sea. We don't know what part of the base that iceberg held, but it's entirely possible that one of those bamboo markers stood over the buried cruiser, now drifting out into the Ross Sea and eventually to the seabed. Part of me still hopes that one day she'll maybe emerge jutting out of a decades-old iceberg, somehow maybe clinging to the Ross ice shelf, maybe even dredged up from the seabed by a confused trawler. One thing's for sure though, however much the Antarctic snow cruiser completely failed in her task to explore the southern continent of Antarctica, she'll still live on as one of the most impressive and ambitious pieces in automotive history and exploration. Thanks very much for watching this video on the Antarctic Snow Cruiser. Um, absolutely mad piece of Arctic and Antarctic exploration history. And I actually wrote the notes for this video about three or four years ago. I didn't really know what I was going to make, whether it was going to be a video, an article or a series of tweets, whatever. But something about this story has always really fascinated me. And I think what I like the most is just how misguided and odd this whole project was. For one, Bird had been inspired by Scott's use of motor sledges that were, by almost all accounts, completely useless. They were a failure and a burden compared to the cost and the time associated with using and maintaining them out there. And Scott had only jumped on board with these sledges because of what he had thought was a success with Shackleton's motor car, which had also been largely useless and was, to be honest, essentially a publicity stunt to raise interest 
interest for this expedition. All of these things were really, um, from the motor car to the plane or the, the air sledge or the air tractor, they'd been something to rile up public interest to make it more than just another return to the Antarctic. But leave it to the Americans to make their publicity stunt this multi-million pound behemoth of American engineering that was essentially useless. And Bird wasn't stupid. He'd been out there numerous times. Why they chose to use these treadless tyres and um, very odd design choices on it, I'll, I'll never know. But hey, the whole thing worked. I'm obsessed with it, as are many others. People remember Little America and, and Bird's contribution and Poulter's mad machine. Um, I just wish they'd actually managed to take the whole thing home. Uh, if the Russians did steal it and did somehow reverse engineer it into something that was useful, good on them. I'm glad they actually got a chance to take it back and use it. Now, there is loads I haven't actually covered properly in this video. And if you're interested in the subject, I'd recommend looking at the description below where I've detailed all the sources I've used and referenced. There's also my website, callumgillis.com. Um, I've got an article up there and I'll go into the subject along with all the links and photo content, video content that I've used and, and where I got it from. Um, there's also a great website called joelD.net slash snow cruiser and it is probably the most definitive best source for videos photo content plans even models of the cruiser i think it's just a personal website um, that was made up to kind of compile a lot of this information um, i'd really recommend though antarctica a biography it's by david day and it's got a much larger overview of the history of the antarctic exploration in general and where little america and, and birds explorations and the snow cruiser fit into the larger history of the continent um, it, it's where i first found out about the explorer and, and birds expeditions in general because I'm more focused on the early heroic age of Antarctic exploration as it's sometimes referred to. Um, I have almost every book I can find on the subject of early exploration in Antarctica but I found that Antarctica a biography is probably the best read uh, for an overview of the subject. But anyway thank you very much for watching. Feel free to look at a few of my other videos. I, I tend to do a lot of different things so you're probably not going to find uh, a whole playlist of videos all about Antarctic machines but there's other stuff on there as well and uh, yeah we'll see you later. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.